Welcome everyone to the Biblical Study in Ancient History session. Our first speaker of the day is Alan Dickin, and I'm going to turn the session over to him. Okay, so thank you for coming to this session. And um, let me just get straight in here with um, a quote from um, the book of Hebrews. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That is what the ancients were commended for. And then it goes on to say, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family in the next chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So obviously the, uh, the acts of faith by these heroes are described in order to inspire us to acts of, of faith, but they're only witnesses if they actually existed. The uh, more complicated question is, um, how can we work out the details of the ancient history uh, in practice? So we know that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are set in Mesopotamia. So if Genesis describes real history, it should dovetail with the ancient history of Mesopotamia, which is revealed through its geology, its archaeology, its literature, and its history. And so this is just introducing my new book, which is on Amazon, which examines the, this evidence in unprecedented detail in order to situate uh, the biblical patriarchs in ancient history. Now, uh, we know that the first, chap the first 11 chapters of Genesis are less than 1% of the Bible, but they correspond to more than half of human history. So in this chart, you can see um, I've put Adam around um, 8,000 BC, 10,000 years ago, and Abraham 2,000 BC. And the most important first step in fitting this history uh, with the Bible is to try to date Noah's flood. So before we talk about the uh, calendar date of Noah's flood, what time of year was it? It says on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep were opened. And bearing in mind that the new year starts at the equinox, this shows that Noah's flood, according to the Bible, occurred near the end of May. And this dovetails perfectly with when the Euphrates used to reach its maximum flood before the large dams were built on the Euphrates in the last 50 years. And you can see the, the intensity of the Euphrates flood in May compared with its flow other times of the year. There's many lines of evidence that show that the flood, Noah's flood occurred in Mesopotamia. Some of the, the evidence is, for example, that Mesopotamia is the largest area of flat land on earth. It has more than 100,000 square kilometers with less than 50 meters of vertical relief, as you can see in this map. But more than that, um, if you look on the right hand side, cross section of one of the channels of the Euphrates, you can actually see that the river flows in a, um, a bed which is above the level of the rest of the plain. In fact, the, um, the levee of the river is five meters above the level of the plain. With, this is with the vertical exaggeration shown. And this shows that if the river burst its banks, then it will cause a catastrophic inundation of tens of thousands of square kilometers of the plain. This is actually a view of the plain from the top of the Ur Ziggurat, looking to the northeast, which is the direction of the nearest high mountains. And you can see that there are no mountains visible. That's because of the curvature of the earth. And in fact, in fact um, the view is the same in every direction. You can see pictures on the web of the views from the top of the ziggurat. It's, the land is completely flat. And the only features are artificial mountains 
built by humans, and those are the mountains which the flood must have inundated. Now, um, if we want to date the timing of the flood um, precisely in calendar a calendar um, years, the most precise paleoclimate evidence comes from cave deposits. Now, of course, there are no caves in um, Mesopotamia, but the Fertile Crescent has a regional weather pattern, so we can apply evidence from elsewhere in the Fertile Crescent. And this is a cave from the Levant, and it was studied by Barmathieu et al. And specifically, we're seeing here the carbon isotope ratio, which is indicative of um, the quality and quantity of flood water entering the cave. And what you see here is that 8,000 years ago, which is to say 6,000 BC, there's an intense peak of Delta C13, which is unique in the last 100,000 years. This same period, 6,000 BC, is characterized um, by a sapropel, which is a peaty layer on the sea floor, for example, the Mediterranean, and it's indicative of severe river flooding at the time. In fact, it's so well known, it's called S1, Sapropel 1, um, as a regional signature of flooding. Now, at the same time, seawater was, sea level was rising after the last glacial maximum. In fact, um, the last glacial maximum is around 20,000 BC, and sea level rose by about a centimeter per year because it, it was more than 100 meters below the present level. So this is a profile showing rising sea level, but suddenly at 5,000 BC, sea level stops rising at the same time as it's reached the Mesopotamian plain. Now, to understand the significance of this uh, confluence of events, we have to look at this cross section. This is a cross section of the Karen River, which is a river that uh, in southwest Iran that cuts across part of the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian plain. And this section, um, sorry, the river is meandering. And so this section cuts across two of the riverbeds. Now, if you look at the gray uh, material at the bottom, these are the older sedim um, sediments. And what this cross section shows is the river has cut deep gorges into these older sediments. These go gorges are more than 10 meters deep. In fact, they didn't reach the bottom when they, when they bored the drill holes. So what this means is that um, as the um, as sea level is rising after the last glaciation, the river is confined to these gorges. So therefore it can't flood the plain. So in other words, during this time, if there's a flood, it only floods the gorge and then anyone who's in there just has to climb out of the gorge and they're safe. But if you look at the right hand side, you can see some radiocarbon dates and they show that um, sea level at 5,600 BC, it's finally reaching the level of the plain. And then after that, the river can flood the whole plain catastrophically. And lastly, we see evidence from um, the city of Uruk that shows human occupation back to around 5,000 BC. And below that, the PT layer, which is the best candidate for the flood horizon. So all the evidence points to uh, Noah's flood around 5,600 BC. And um, the question is, could, could, this, could the ark have been built at this time? And in fact, if we compare the biblical account with the Mesopotamian accounts, it shows that the ark is the size of a one acre field. And this could have been built in the Neolithic if it was built as a giant raft with a reed hut on top of it. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is 
how the flood informs our understanding of Genesis 1. For over 2,000 years, scholars have treated the flood as a kind of uncreation that returns the earth to its primordial chaotic state. And when the waters go down, the earth is recreated. But supposing that instead of the uh, flood story being inspired um, by creation, it was the other way around. Supposing flood story inspired the creation story. The retreat of the flood has to begin with a world of chaotic water, but the creation doesn't have to begin with a world of water. For example, in Genesis 2, it begins with dry desert. So what can we say about the uh, idea of uh, order emerging out of chaos in Genesis 1? <coughs> the idea of order emerging from chaos applies to the creation of light. The Hebrew word for darkness in Genesis 1-2 can mean night, but it can also mean indeterminate darkness. For example, six Old Testament usages refer to extremely dark clouds during the daytime, and three usages refer to the plague of darkness in Egypt during the daytime. So an indeterminate state of darkness would be experienced during the flood, and that could have inspired the picture of chaos in Genesis 1. Uh, in contrast, the first creative act of separation leads to the first clearly defined day. So similar principles apply to the creative act of separation on day two between the waters above and below the sky. Prior to this separation, the space between the heavenly and the earthly waters was full of water. This is not solid water, but a chaotic mixture of air and water, which is to say intense rain, which is then brought to an end when God separates the waters. In the same way, the third act of separation, day three, involved God hemming in the chaotic waters below the sky. So the brown waters of a flood <coughs> show they represent a chaotic mixture of water and earth. When God separates uh, the water from the earth, we obtain dry land on one hand and the sea on the other. And the sea is clear, it's not brown, which shows that the chaos has been markedly reduced. So this is my conclusion. I suggest that God used the flood as the basis for a series of visions that reveal the story of creation. Spiritual intensification is achieved by using the overwhelming experience of the cosmic flood as inspiration for the creation story. As an analogy, consider the process of intensification that occurs when a scene is captured by an impressionist painter. The Canadian group of seven painter Lauren Harris intensified the spiritual qualities of his paintings by abstracting and exaggerating the dramatic qualities of the northern landscape. So in the same way, the floods, the creation story based on the flood can intensify uh, the story of creation. So these are the conclusions. A Mesopotamian flood around 5,600 BC is consistent with the biblical account of the catastrophic flood that destroyed all of the known earth, placing the flood at this early stage in Mesopotamian history can explain the biblical belief that all Middle Eastern peoples were descended from Noah. The overwhelming experience of the flood could have been the inspiration for the Genesis 1 creation story. And a scientific account of the origins of the cosmos, on the other hand, would not have achieved the same emotional connection with an ancient audience. So I conclude that Genesis describes real history, but described from an ancient perspective. Thanks a lot. Okay, in the scheme of things, 
the ark ends up, if you will, upriver rather than if it was a flood, be going downriver. Um, how does this scenario explain that? Okay, well, um, you're, you're obviously referring to the uh, account that uh, the, the ark ended up on Mount Ararat. But yeah. um, I elsewhere have suggested that um, this is simply a case of two places with very similar names that the, clearly uh, the, um, the Bible doesn't mean Mount Ararat in uh, Armenia because it's hundreds of miles away from Mesopotamia. Um, almost certainly it means um, the mountains of Arata, which are on the east side of Mesopotamia. So um, okay. basically, Mesopotamia during the flood is essentially static water. You know, we've got tens of thousands of square kilometers of flood water. We've got the sea, which is basically preventing the flood waters from draining away. So essentially, we don't have any river flow. We just have, I mean, we have the effect of wind blowing around. But um, yeah, this is basically an inland sea. Okay, and if it's to the east, there any, any draining still goes out to the Persian Gulf, and to the east would be more plausible than upriver, which would be to the west. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Paul, we have time for your question. Yes, uh, Alan, thank you again for uh, your presentation. It's, it's great to see you again after... Uh, several years. Uh, thank you also for the several books that you've been writing about this area, and uh, it's added a lot of uh, interesting uh, new perspectives on this. I just had a, a detailed question. There, there are two equinoxes in the year. Uh, which one was this? And also, um, you know, the um, what does this uh, have to say in general about the acceptance of climate change uh, among uh, evangelicals? Uh, okay, I think climate change is maybe outside my uh, field here, but uh, I'm a geologist right enough. But uh, we're talking about the spring equinox, I should have said. And it's the, uh, I think it's the first new moon after the spring equinox. Uh, there's various papers that describe the ancient way of beginning the year, which was uh, general in the Middle East. So it would be... Um, uh, near the end of March or middle or end of March, it would vary from year to year. So yeah, so uh, it puts the flood at the end of May, something like that. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to climate change here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all the time we're going to have for questions for this talk. Uh, so thank you very much, Alan, for a stimulating presentation. <laughs>